Okay, welcome friends. We're going to go ahead and get started. Running just a tad behind, but we will, we will get through it anyway. Uh, for, for those that are, are new or may have forgotten, uh, we have a sheet that you can grab if you want to follow along. There's some pens back there if, uh, if you need one. Hey, Jim is going to do express delivery today. Uh, this does not happen every week. He will, he will bring it to you if you desire one. Uh, but we're going uh, to go ahead and get started. Let me pray for us. We've got a few announcements, and then we are going to get started and uh, try, to, try to get through some stuff this evening. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, and as always, we are just so happy to be your people. We're happy for the, the blessing of your presence in this place. And God, we just pray that you would uh, give us discernment, let your spirit guide us, give us wisdom as we discuss your word. And Father, uh, um, we, we also ask that you would illuminate where we need to apply these things in our life, where we can move the gospel forward in our own lives and make a difference uh, in our own discipleship and in the discipleship of others to lead others to know you and to know you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Okay, so we've got a few things to discuss before we get started here. Um, JoLynn, I'm going to announce that, but remind me at the end, because we've, we've got a few different things going on here. Um, so number one, and, and please don't cheer too loudly when I announce this, but we're going to make a slight change starting today to our schedule for uh, the chapel class, and I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, but starting today, and you're not going to believe me, but I promise it's true, we're going to go from 6 to 6.45 Okay, as opposed to 7 o'clock, and here's why. Um, we've had some scheduling things going on where we're trying to f let everybody get their thing in, all right? So college and choir and all these different things, we're trying to give everybody a chance to be at everything uh, that they can be at and, and be able to serve. And those, those ministries are excellent. We want to support them. One of the ways that we can do that is by shortening 15 minutes, all right, so that people can get to choir and start choir at 7. They're going to go from 7 to 8. And then our college ministry is going to go from 8 to 9. That's going to let everybody do everything that they need to do. And so I'm going to do my very, very best to start shortening it up. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get out of here by 645 instead of 7 o'clock. So, so for some of y'all, y'all get home uh, before your show starts at 7 from now on, hopefully. Uh, so a couple other... Th uh, or they can join the choir. Or you can join the choir. And tape your show, because that's a thing, right? And so um, we, we would love for that to happen. Um, in fact, I haven't told them this yet, but I'm going to try to be there. And so if, if, uh, if y'all want to join me and join and being in the choir this year, we, I know they would love to have you. A uh, couple of other things before uh, we get started. I do want to make you um, aware, uh, as you probably already know, uh, former youth pastor here, Josh Mee, his uh, wife passed away. Uh, the funeral is on Saturday at 10 o'clock. Uh, what we are going to do, obviously it's in Arkansas, it's not here. What we are going to do, we're going to open up the sanctuary and we're going to, for lack of a better term, simulcast it. We'll have it up on the screen. I believe it's going to be uh, shown on YouTube. We'll have the YouTube things up on the screen, but we're going to open up the sanctuary if people would like to come uh, and be in this place as they watch that together. Uh, you are welcome to do that, and uh, the doors will be open at 930, and then we will get started at 10 o'clock. So uh, we're not going to do any music or anything like that. It's really just going to be you come. I'll kind of pray a little bit before 10 o'clock to, to get us started, uh, and then when it finishes, we'll ask everybody to come kind of skedaddle and, and we'll clean it up before Sunday. But we want to make that available to you if you so desire. Uh, and last thing, and then I'm going to make one more announcement at the end about the wheelhouse. Um, but uh, Jim asked me to announce to you about Katha Wiley. I don't know how many of y'all um, have heard this news, but they did some tests on her and she is cancer free. And there's a whole... <laughs> story behind it um, that, that you can ask her and I'm sure she will animatedly tell you about it in the way that only Katha can and uh, she will be be uh, ecstatic I'm sure. Go ahead Jim. She's having a little trouble breathing because she has some inflammation in the lungs so just keep that in mind. Yeah maybe it'll be a short story okay <laughs> uh, before until she, she gets things back. Last thing I'll say and then we'll, we'll jump into this. Thank you all for your prayers for me. I've had a couple of different things going on on top of each other. Um, one, I'm not ready quite to tell you about because I don't really know what it is yet. They're still trying to tell me. The other one, I just had a cold and, and I didn't think y'all wanted me to show up and cough and sneeze all over y'all and look like I you know, swollen eye and everything, like somebody had punched me or something, but I'm back, we're back, and so we're going to jump right into things this evening uh, and get started. And so, um, first thing I like to do, just in case people have forgotten or if there's new people in the room, is to tell you why we're here, because if you hear it enough, you'll start telling other people, maybe, or it'll just start showing up in your mind when you're not thinking about it. But this is a Bible study, obviously, but this is bi this Bible study is designed to be just a little bit different. I'm not just going to stand up here and say, here's what these verses mean, but we have a theme for the church. We have a mission for our church, a, uh, a vision for our church for this year that is moving forward with the gospel. 
The way that we are trying to accomplish that in this Bible study is we're going through the Gospel of John and not just going through it to figure out what it means, but going through it for two main reasons. To figure out how I can become a greater disciple, more devoted disciple of Jesus Christ, and how I can help other people do the same thing. How I can become a more devoted disciple and how I can be a better disciple maker. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. So what that means is that we're going to take some potential detours here. We may talk about uh, apologetics, which means defending the faith. We may talk about uh, some evangelism methods, some discipleship methods. We may uh, talk about some theology. Today in particular, we're, it's going to sort of center around uh, a particular Bible study method that's going to sort of... Uh, uh, characterize what we're going to talk about this evening. And so that's what we're trying to do in order to move the gospel forward, is to become a more devoted disciple, make disciples. And so let's, let's kind of review what we're going to do, uh, or what we did last week. We saw John chapter 11. We talked about John chapter 11, um, which is uh, a, a story about the death and resurrection of Lazarus. And so we kind of put that in context of what was going on in the life of our church. And so uh, just, just a heads up, we're going to try to make these a little shorter uh, since we, we've only got 45 minutes. So I'm just going to give you the high point. Um, as we saw last week, Jesus uh, hears that Lazarus is sick. Uh, says, I'm just going to wait and, until uh, it's time to go. And, and he had a different timing than everyone else thought that he should have. In fact, he shows up, Mary and Martha both, folks that, that we've seen in other Bible stories, say, if you had been here, Jesus, my brother would not have died. But Jesus was doing something else here. In fact, when Martha went to say this, Jesus said, your brother is going to be resurrected. And her response to him uh, was a little bit, she thought that Jesus was just giving uh, her a platitude. And she said, I know on the last day he'll be resurrected. And, and she just thought Jesus was saying that nice thing you say when someone you love passes away. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. And then we got to these I am statements that we've been talking about. And Jesus says, I am, you remember what it was this, that week, 1125? I am the resurrection and the life. It's not just that there is resurrection. I am the resurrection. The person that I am is the reason that there is going to be a resurrection. The reason that there is going to be eternal life is because of me and what I am about to do. Ah, oh, here we go. There's some light on me here. I always forget to turn those on. Uh, and so they're having this conversation. Jesus then really does raise Lazarus from the dead. One of the things that we talked about, though, is that folks get caught up on the wrong thing when they read this passage sometimes. And you see it today in different denominations. They say, well, there, I have somebody in my church that has the power to raise someone from the dead. And that's what we should be trying to do is raise people from the dead. And that's proof that uh, God is with us. He's not with your church. He's with our church. And it is to miss the entire point. Because what Jesus was trying to say is, yes, I have control over death and life. He proved that by raising Lazarus from the dead. But what he was trying to emphasize was not the resurrection of one person. But that the resurrection and the life that we have in Jesus Christ when we put our faith in him is much greater than raising a person physically from the dead. That is what we should celebrate even more. We, we would get really excited at the idea of someone who was dead being raised to life again. Do we get equally or more excited when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ and we know that they will be resurrected and live with him forever? That is the greater thing. That's also the background of what we're going to see today in the passage that we're going to be talking about. In fact, we're going to step right into the aftermath of this discussion. So let's jump right in. We're going to be in John chapter 11. Uh-oh, I was in Hebrews. Let me jump back over. John chapter 11. And I believe we're starting with verse 45. 45. Like I said, we're going to talk about some Bible study methods today, but before we do that, 
Um, let's look at 45. And, and you would think, so Jesus just raised some money from the dead. The crowds are starting to gather. And they, verse 45, they all love Jesus and everybody believed in him. Yay. No, that's not, what, that's not what's going to happen. People are upset, as usually happens when Jesus does a miracle that tells the truth about who he is. So let's read. We're going to read verses 45 through 53. 45 through 53. It says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him, meaning Jesus. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So one of my favorite questions, I'm going to tell you what I see in here, but I want you to tell me what do you see in here? What sticks out to you as you are reading these verses? Is there anything where you go, okay, well, I hadn't noticed that before, or that seemed interesting to me? Anybody? Yeah, so we're going to talk a lot about that tonight, that there is a, an underlying meaning to so much of what is going on in these verses. Oh, oh, oh. See, that's, that's the thing that I think is most interesting, is that we're sort of getting behind the scenes here, right, with the Pharisees. Thus far, I don't know if John, somebody told him what happened here or what, but thus far, all we've seen is the Pharisees directly dealing with Jesus, right? We've seen them saying, hey, we think you're wrong because of this, and who do you think you are because of this? You don't have the right or the power or the authority to say these different things. Now... We get to hear their conversation when Jesus is not around. And I think we're starting to hear some honesty more so than we've heard from them before. Ah. That's interesting. We're going we're gonna to talk about that too. Here's some interesting things going on here. So let's do this. So let me ask you, verse 48, what are they specifically afraid of? What are the Pharisees, the leaders, what are they afraid of? Okay, so it says that people will believe in Jesus. That's what they're afraid of. And if they believe in Jesus, what is going to happen? They will lose, what does it say, their place? And their nation. Now, sometimes when we talk about this, we, we, in the Greek in particular, we say, hey, this doesn't translate real great into English because of this or this or this. This time, I actually think this is fantastic, okay? And let me tell you why. Because the word place in there, when we see this in English and somebody says, oh, I'm going to lose my place, what are they talking about? Usually they're talking about their position, right? Their position, their status. That's not necessarily what they're saying here. In the Greek, this means a physical location. And, it, and, and the physical location that, that they are most likely talking about is the temple, okay? The, the, the temple. And so literally what they're saying is, if Jesus comes in and starts stirring all this stuff up, the Romans are going to take the temple from us, and they're going to take our nation from us. But... What they're really saying, I think, is what it translates to in English. Because the temple and the nation are just representative of a couple of things that are important to them as the leaders. What they're really afraid of losing is, in English, what we would describe as their place. 
their power, their position, their influence. That's what they're afraid of of missing out on here. And we're going to see why um, that's the case here in just a few minutes because we're going to get some more uh, uh, pointing at different things that are not necessarily uh, visible on the surface. But then let's go to verse 49. So they're all getting riled up and going, oh my gosh, we're going to lose everything. It's terrible, all that sort of thing. And then Caiaphas comes in, Caiaphas, who is the high priest, and he basically says, you guys don't know anything. And he's saying, if you'll just kill this guy, we'll be fine. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying. All of our problems will be solved if you guys would just agree that we need to kill this guy. Our position will stay. The temple will stay. The Jews in this time, in in Roman occupation, were what we call semi-autonomous. They got to make a certain amount of decisions for themselves. And as long as things were peaceful, that's what the Romans cared about. As long as you're not stirring up any trouble, we'll kind of let you do what you want to do. All right, that's, that's kind of where they were. And so that is what is at threat here. And Caiaphas says, listen, if you'll just kill this guy, we won't have any more issues. All right. But here's what we're going to get to tonight. Let's, let's talk about our first point. Caiaphas, we, we, already, we already said that. How did this guy prophesy, right? Was, was he actually speaking the truth of God on Jesus' side about this situation? Not necessarily on Jesus' side. He's speaking something that's going to happen, but it's not because he's on that same side. God is working through his sin for him to say something that is actually very, very true despite the fact that he doesn't understand that at this point. And let me explain that to you, but let's get to point one first. Point one here, you're filling the blanks. And, and I'll be honest with you, I don't like how I phrase this, and we'll talk about that in here in a second, but let's just fill in the blank. <laughs> to truly understand the meaning of the Gospels, we have to understand two things, illusions and foreshadowing. And if you don't use those words and are not real sure how to spell them, they're actually at the top of your sheet there. I I gave you a little cheat sheet there. Illusions and foreshadowing. Illusions and foreshadowing. And I want you to understand that these are things that are going to help you get greater sort of understanding and meaning about what's going on, especially in these passages. This is the Bible study method that I was speaking of. If you can understand these things, it will bring out so much more meaning. Now, I said previously... I didn't like how I phrased this. I don't want you to think that unless you know all this stuff that you can't really understand what the gospel means. That's not the case. I probably should have phrased it differently. What I mean by this is if you can understand the illusions and the foreshadowing, this thing will come alive for you. There is so much going on here that John is trying to uh, uh, sort of point out without having a flashing neon sign, right? Saying it without saying it. And we're about to get into some of those things, all right? Now, for illusions and foreshadowing to be helpful to you, you have to be willing to say one particular thing. This is sort of an underlying principle of Bible study method. You have to believe that the entire Bible is a singular story. From Genesis to Revelation, we are telling one continuous story. Now, I believe that because I can see where it's interconnected, and I can see that this is a continuous story. And it's not just a story, but it's a story of redemption. And, and really, it's a love story, and really, it's a sacrificial love story. And so when you're interpreting the Bible, you've got to figure out where you are in this redemption story. Where am I in the plot? Am I in the first scene? Am I in the second scene? Am I in the third scene? Where, where am I in this particular story so I can understand two things, illusions and foreshadowing? For our purposes tonight, illusions are going to be the things where we're looking back. We're looking back into the Old Testament. This is referring to something that is in the Old Testament that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of. 
And then foreshadowing is going to be the thing that in the story hasn't happened yet, but is going to happen. So illusion is looking back. Foreshadowing is looking forward. And we're going to see so many examples of that tonight. We're going to look at two or three here. So that's, what's, that's what we're seeing here with Caiaphas. Now, what do I mean by illusion or foreshadowing? I want you to look at, let's see what verse we're talking about here. Let's look at verse 50. Verse 50. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation should perish. What doesn't show up in English here is that Caiaphas is using uh, language of the temple. Caiaphas is using sacrificial language here from the, from the Old Testament, from the, the Mosaic Covenant, Moses, and hey, when we sin, we have to sacrifice an animal, right? Specifically, whether he realizes it or not, whether God led him here and he was understanding it or not, he is making a reference to something called Yom Kippur. Anybody ever heard that before, Yom Kippur? That is the Day of Atonement. And what would happen on this Day of Atonement is that the chief priest, like Caiaphas, would bring out a goat, okay? He would pray... And essentially what they're, what's going on in this ceremony is he is transferring the sins of the people to this goat. And the goat is going to die for the sins of the people. The scapegoat. The scapegoat. Have y'all heard that word before? The scapegoat? That's what we're talking about here. It's a scapegoat. The, the goat didn't sin. He doesn't have anything to do with the sins of the people, right? But they are transferring the sin here. They are sacrificing the goat for the sins of the people. Does that have something to do with Jesus? 100%. That's what we're about to see here. He is about to go to the cross. So the allusion is to Yom Kippur, right? Pointing back to the Old Testament in Leviticus, it describes this. And then the foreshadowing is this same thing is going to happen to Jesus. The high priest is going to be involved in this situation. They're going to place, or God himself, God the Father, we see in Isaiah, is going to place the sins of the people on Jesus. And he is going to die for the sins of the nation. Now, the, John even explains this is a prophetic word, but he doesn't understand, Caiaphas doesn't understand that what he has spoken is prophetic. He is speaking from his own sort of uh, selfish judgment here to say, yeah, let's just kill him because it's easier for us. But in God's economy, he has actually spoke, spoken the truth about what Jesus is going to do and to be for the people of Israel. Let's keep moving here because we're going to see it again. So now go down to verse 55. We read through 53. 54, it says Jesus no longer walked openly among them. And then it says, verse 55, this is a transition in sort of the whole uh, book of John. Not just in this chapter, but in the book of John. It says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. The rest of John is going to deal with just this small portion of Jesus' life that is about to happen right before the cross, the, the, the week of the, the crucifixion, and then the things directly afterwards. And so this is sort of the pivot point of we've been kind of jumping back and forth, and we've been looking at all these different things, um, but now we're getting to the point where Jesus is going to die, and he's starting to tell people more about that he's going to die. Now, let's talk about Passover for a second. Here's another illusion and another foreshadowing. So let's talk about Passover. Passover was an event that happened in the book of Exodus. 
I'm going to give you just some quick facts here for, for folks that may not know. Um, God's people were in slavery in Egypt. Uh, God spoke to a man named Moses and said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh. What did he say to go tell him? Let my people go, right? Okay. Pharaoh didn't want to do that because at this point in time, the Jews were slaves in Egypt. He didn't want to lose uh, his, his slaves. And so there's a back and forth there. And to convince Pharaoh to let his people go, God sent some plagues onto Pharaoh. Does anybody remember what some of the plagues were? Don't say the last one, but what, what are some of the other ones? Frogs. What else? Blood, river of blood. What else? Gnats. Locusts. I mean, uh, boils. We, we've got lots of things, right? It, it was not a great time, okay? But then we get to the very last uh, plague, the one that is going to convince them that it's time to let them go. All right. It's no mistake that Jesus was killed at Passover. We're going to see some connections uh, here. So before I tell you, anybody want to take a shot at Jesus' connection with, with Passover? A short version. He is the lamb. So part of what happened, uh, the, the, the angel of the Lord was going to come and they said, listen, the firstborn in all of Egypt is going to die. The way that you're going to pre prevent that, Israelites, is you're going to slay a lamb. You're going to take the blood. You're going to put it over the doorframe. When the angel comes by and he sees the blood over the doorframe, he's going to pass over your house. And so that's why it's called Passover. Passover. And at that point, that's what happened. They, they died, um, and, and God's people went out of Egypt. This is the salvation story of the Old Testament. Many scholars will say this is the most important event that happens in the entire Old Testament. We see the, the fruits of salvation within this. But for us, we're thinking about Passover. What does that have to do with Jesus? Well, think about it. Jesus is the firstborn. He is the lamb that was slain. His very blood is the thing that we would put over our proverbial doorframe to allow the wrath of God, the righteous judgment of God to pass over us. So we have an allusion back to the Old Testament and we have foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus that is going to be the sacrifice, the thing that allows the judgment of God to pass over us. So let's keep moving. Okay, let me, let me ask this question uh, before we get to verse 12, 1 through 8. Um, there are three main roles that Jesus is described as having in the New Testament. Does anybody know what those are? Well, I know you know what they are. I'm going to let everybody else go. Okay, those, those, are, those are titles. There's three main offices. That's what they call them. I should have said offices that, that uh, the Old Testament has that Jesus is the fulfillment of. What is it? Prophet, priest, king. Prophet, priest, and king. Tonight, we're going to see one of these in particular foreshadowing uh, towards this. And it's very much, if you read these separately, you can miss it. But if you read them together, you go, they're talking about him as a king. Okay? And so let's, let's look at these. Let's read John 12, 1 through 8. 12, 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served him, and Lazarus was, was one of those reclining with him at a table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. 
Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. So there's two things going on in this passage, I think, simultaneously. And so I'm curious if anybody has a, um, in a, a thought about what they might be, what the symbolism, there's two symbolisms going on in this passage. And let me give you a little bit of a hint, and maybe you can tell me. What are the two times we see in the Old Testament where people are anointed for something? Okay, when somebody becomes a king, and what else? When it's time to die, okay? Those are the two main things, right? We might see it in some other places, but when they're preparing a body and when somebody is becoming king. And I think we're seeing allusions foreshadowing to both of these things here. Now, why do I think about that? So let's talk about first the preparation um, of, of Jesus' body. Now, he's not dead yet, right? But what we're talking about here is foreshadowing. And so what we have here is uh, Mary breaking this stuff, and, and it helps. You can't see it completely in John here, but if you read in Matthew and Mark as well, it says that he is anointed on his head, and it says he is anointed on his body. Okay, So she has anointed basically most of him right? That's what you would do before a body uh, would be prepared before they place it in the tomb. And so the only reason really that you would do this otherwise, even outside of being a king, is to pre prepare a body before it is to be placed in the tomb. Now, did Mary understand that this is what she's doing? I'm preparing his body. Uh, no, no, that's not what's going on here. But what she does contributes to the symbolism of what we see here. That Jesus is already on the path that is going to take him to the cross. Okay? Now, I want us to see a couple of other things here when it comes to um, that. Let's move on to the king thing first. So this is a little bit more uh, uh, difficult um, to to prove in John because we don't have the head thing, right? So usually in the Old Testament, you anoint somebody's head with oil. That proves that they are the king. We see that in Matthew and Mark, okay? And so I'm going to assert to you that's the same thing that's going on here. And we're going to see that Jesus essentially is being anointed as king as well. So not only is he saying, I'm going to be uh, uh, killed, but also that God has anointed him as the king of David. Now, I want you to, to notice a couple of things here. Why do you think that, that, sh that John specifically talks about anointing the feet? Because the other ones say, no, it was the head, it was the body. And I don't think they're in contradiction to each other. I think they're just talking about different things. But this talks specifically about Mary anointing the feet of Jesus. Why do you think that is? Yeah, so I think, I think this is telling us how we're res supposed to respond, not only to the one who died for our sins, but to the king, right? This is, this is the way that we are supposed to respond. Mary is our example here of what we should be doing as well. Okay, and we're going to get to our second point here in just a minute that's really going to illustrate this. But this is telling us um, that our passion, our attention, um, our, our, the things that we find valuable should be pointed at Jesus, right? So that's why she's anointing him in the first place, but the feet in particular, because yes, that's what a servant does. That's who we are to Jesus, is we are his servant. Yes, Under his feet as the king, absolutely. There's another uh, um, prophecy in Isaiah that Paul repeats in Romans. Uh, Beautiful are the feet of the one who brings the good news of the gospel of peace. These are literally those feet. 
And so she is anointing those feet. So I think there's different layers of things going on in this passage. But we've got to move on here uh, because of our short time. But I want you to compare this. I want you to think about Mary and I want you to think about uh, Judas's responses here. And even more so, think about Mary and then what you know about Martha, right? You've got these two people that are responding in particular kinds of ways. And on the surface, you go, well, yeah, what about the poor? And, and you think about the stories with Martha. And Martha was upset with Mary when Jesus would come to the house. And I don't know about y'all, but I was raised this way. Martha's over here doing the work. Mary's sitting around supposedly doing nothing, right? It's like, get up. Get up off your rear and get in gear, right? Help out, right? But Jesus says that's not the right thing to do. And so that's our second point tonight. Our second fill in the blank. Don't let ministry, in quotes, get in the way of serving Jesus. Don't let ministry get in the way of serving Jesus. And I put ministry in quotes because true ministry is, is to God himself. But we can have these ideas of what ministry is, this busy work of what ministry is, and we forget Jesus completely. And I want to remind you of something as a warning here, and I'm not speaking necessarily to anybody in this room, but I want to remind you of what Jesus writes in Matthew, uh, in, the, in the gospel of Matthew. Um, he says that on the last day, there will be people who say to him, Lord, Lord, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And he says, what? I never knew you. So you've got these two examples here of people who are going, yeah, but I'm going to do this. And God says, that's not what I'm counting on. I want to know you. I want a relationship. And we see that with Mary and Martha. Not that Martha was a bad person. She just didn't get that in the same way that Mary did in this particular time. So as Christians, we have to be careful that we're not running around going, we've got to do all this stuff. We've got to do this program and we've got to do this thing and we've got to do this and this and this. And we forget that we're here to glorify and serve Jesus. And it can sound righteous even. Judas sounds real righteous here, right? Oh, yeah, we, we could have sold that for the poor. And see, that's something that we should really care about. And Jesus says, not even that is worth ignoring me. So we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Okay, so let's, let's keep moving here because I, I really want us to get to the last part of this. Let's get to verse 9 through 11. So Jesus has been anointed as king... And then 9 through 11, they're talking about, well, that Lazarus is kind of proof that Jesus is who he says he is, so we want to get rid of him. Let's jump down to verse 12. It says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Let's stop right there for just a second. So let me, let me ask us some questions here. You tell me, why were, the G, why were the crowds with Jesus in the first place? Because of the miracle of what? Lazarus. They were there for him because he had raised Lazarus from the dead. They were already there, and now they see this happen, and what is their response? They start what? Waving the palm branches, and they shout, Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? God save us, or save us now, we pray. Like, and, and, and here's the thing that's going on. Do you know the significance of the palm branches? I didn't know this until I started researching this. Palm branches had a special significance in Jewish life. This is another illusion. Palm branches became the symbol of Jewish nationalism. Them being able to rule themselves. We don't have time to go into it tonight, but did you know that certain groups of Christian people have a different Bible than we do? They add some books in there. Some of what they add in there 
there are the books in between, or books that were written in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And some of those books talk about a clan of Jewish warriors called the Maccabees. And the Maccabees, in, a, in about the 160s, 140s BC, uh, were folks that rose up, overthrew, at that time it was not uh, the Romans, it was the Syrians, overthrew their rule, okay? And the Jews got to, to govern themselves. And as, uh, I don't remember which Maccabee it was, maybe Judas Maccabee is riding into Jerusalem as the conquering hero, what do they do? They wave the palm branches and they lay them down in front of him. So now we have Jesus and the people remember this. This is not that long ago from them. This is just a few generations ago. They see Jesus coming. He's raised someone from the dead. And what do they do? They bust out the palm branches. It's going to be like the Maccabees again. And we're waving the palm branches. And we lay down the palm branches. And we say, save us now. Not just save us now, conqueror. Not just save us now, great guy over here, warrior. What is it? They call him the what? The king of Israel. In other places in the gospels, they say the son of David. Hosanna, son of David, which is another title for the Messiah. We recognize, they see who he is, but these are the same people that a short time later they're shouting, Hosanna, save us. You are the king of David. You are the king of Israel. And in such a short time, we, we go from that and we get to crucify. Why? How did it happen? They, they, they had an expectation of what the Messiah was. They thought they knew what salvation looked like. They thought salvation was them getting to be in their land, have their temple, be in charge. And Jesus said, that's not what I'm here to do. And they killed him for it. And I didn't realize this until maybe about a year ago. But think about this, and, and we'll, get, we'll get there in John. When they, when they bring Jesus uh, before the Roman uh, proconsul in that area, and he comes out and he says that I will give you one prisoner. I'll let one of you go. He thought they were going to say Jesus because here's a guy who hadn't done anything to anybody. But who do they ask for instead? They asked for Barabbas. What did Barabbas do? He was a murderer, but specifically, he killed somebody in a rebellion, in an uprising. So here's this choice between a Messiah who's saying, I'm not going to make things easier on you. I'm telling you about a relationship with God. I'm freeing you not from the Romans, but from your own sin. You've got that over here, and you've got the conquering hero type that says, I'm for doing what the Maccabees did. I'm for giving us uh, uh, what we want in terms of overthrowing the Romans and letting us do what we want to do in the temple. So you've got these two choices so clearly in front of them. And they choose the physical. They choose the earthly over the heavenly, over the spiritual. That's our last point for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. We must understand that our greatest enemy is, and it's not Satan, it's not the world, it's sin. And if you want to put it in front of it, it's not random sin, it's my sin. My sin is the greatest enemy that we have to overcome. Why? These people saw exactly who Jesus was. They saw that he was Messiah. But what happened to them? They chose themselves over the Messiah. They chose what they wanted over what the Messiah was requiring of them. Now, this is nothing against people who say this. But I think we lead people in a poor direction when we tell them that salvation is free and then we don't say anything else to explain that statement. Yes, you cannot pay for salvation. In that sense, it's free. But it costs everything. 
Let's talk about it in the first sense. You hear this talked about uh, in terms of our country a lot, right? Freedom isn't free. Well, guess what? Salvation is not free in the sense that the Son of God died for it. You want to talk about something that's valuable? That's valuable. The Son of God died for it. But secondly, it requires of us that we give up our entire lives. And that's what the people in this story were not willing to do later on. They were still stuck on, this is what I want, this is what I expect. And it's the same thing that happens today. It's about my desires, my comfort, and my will versus Jesus saying, I'm going to leave you in this world. Things are going to be difficult, but you're going to have a relationship with the God who loves you. And which of those are you going to choose? And I know that I'm already over, but I want to read you a couple of things. So Jesus didn't come as a king the first time. He sits on his throne now, but that's not the way he presented himself the first time. But I want you to see some verses from the book of Revelation so that you will know that the king is coming. And this time, when he comes the second time, it's going to look different than it did the first time. And it should encourage us, but it should also motivate us for those that don't know who he is to let them know who he is. So I wanna, I'm want i just going to read this to you and we're going to be finished. This is from John 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who, has, who loved us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. We jump ahead to Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven open to behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then finally, Revelation 22, a few verses. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires the water of life without price. Now verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Amen. When you read about that triumphal entry, you see that he's coming on a colt. He's coming on a donkey. They're shouting, Hosanna. You know what's going to happen. You know that they're going to reject him. You know that they're going to kill him. But when you read it, I pray that you would remember this as well. That he is coming again. And this time he is coming to draw his people to himself and to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. Not based on us, but whether they believe in Jesus Christ. 
This takes some work, this idea of illusions and foreshadowing. You've got to be able to read the Old Testament, but it's worth it because it comes alive on the page. It makes it so much more real and it connects the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament when you're reading. So that's all I have for you this evening. Let me pray for us and then I have an, a one announcement and we'll be done. And I'm over a little bit. I'll try to do better next week. So let's pray. Father, we come to you and we are just so thankful that you're a God who teaches us in a way that we can understand. We understand stories, God. And God, I'm just so thankful that you allow us to connect these dots, to see the connections across the centuries where you are working. And specifically, Lord, as we see tonight that you are, you are the king. Even in the midst of all this chaos, even in the midst of death and disease and destruction and people cursing your name, you are the king. And we trust in the fact that your word says that you are coming again in righteousness. And Father, so I pray for us that we would not be like the people who only proclaimed you as king when they thought that you were going to do with just what they wanted. That as soon as you did something different, they crucified you. Let us not be that way, Lord. Let our hearts and minds be that of Mary, where we are just sitting at your feet waiting for you to speak. And whatever hardship you call us to, that we would endure it because we love you and we trust you. We trust your word, we trust your wisdom, and we understand that even as we die, we leave this place. That we believe that you are the resurrection and the life. And that because of your goodness, because of your grace and your righteousness, that we will rise again to be with you forever. We thank you for that truth. We thank you for your gospel.